Hey, this is Todd Howard from Fraley's Comet. Cheap Trick, Ted Nugent, 707, and a bunch of other bands you may not know. But you're listening to Nothing Shocking Podcast. Want to know what's going on in the world of music? Then tune in to the Nothing Shocking Podcast, a non-genre-based, all-ages friendly rock and roll program. Join us weekly for interviews with all your favorite rock stars from the mainstream to the underground. You can find us at nothingshocking.libsyn.com or anywhere you download podcasts. We're putting the band back together. The numbers all go to 11. I'm talking about bands that rock. Led Zeppelin. What about Sabbath? ACDC. Motorhead. Does that mean it's louder? Is it any louder? Well, it's one louder, isn't it? We're not worthy! We're not worthy! Why don't you just make 10 louder and make 10 be the top number and make that a little louder? These guys are 11. I get up above the ground and raise my head days like this. Think I should be. Welcome to the Nothing Shocking Podcast. I'm your co-host, Jeff Antiedon, with me in Dog Bowl Studios is... Coach Nuz. You can find the Nothing Shocking Podcast on Lipson or any podcatchers. Like our Facebook page or follow us on Twitter at NoShockPod. You can also find the Nothing Shocking Podcast on Rock Rage Radio every Sunday morning at 7 a.m. Central Time. Our sponsor is Ragged Records, located in downtown Rock Island, Illinois, and downtown Davenport, Iowa. We'd like to thank the Hong Kong Sleepover for allowing us to use their music for our intro and bumper ending. Tonight's guest is... Todd Howarth. Formerly of Freely's Comet. Uh, Cheap Trick. And also Ted Nugent. Uh, he's promoting his three-disc solo series, Comet Canvas, Heavy Canvas, and Coastal Canvas CDs. Yeah, um, all acoustic. Yeah, it's fantastic. So, uh, great interview. Let's get right to it. All right. Good night. Good night. Todd, welcome to the Nothing Shocking Podcast. I'd like to introduce to you my co-host, Jeff Unte. Todd, thanks for joining us tonight. Jeff, how are you doing? Great to be here. Thank you. Well, hey, um, before we get started here, I guess it would be it wouldn't be who of us to to give our give you our condolences yeah. on the passing of John Regan. Um, I guess maybe uh, if you could kind of tell our listeners a little bit more about your working relationship with John, and also outside of music, the friend relationship that you had with him. Well, yeah, it, well, it, it as of uh, this coming Friday, it'll be three Fridays ago that that John had passed unexpectedly. Uh, and it was it was it was a horrifying day. I mean, um, on on many different levels. I, I, I mean, I spoke to everybody that most everybody that day that that had been involved with uh, John and me and and the bands we played in. Um, but, but I go back to when John was playing with uh, John Waite from the Babies, mm. and this was back in '86. Uh, Six, this particular tour was 86, I think mid, mid 86. And we, Cheap Trick, when I was playing uh, keyboards for Cheap Trick, we were touring with them. And I, I, I'm a big fan of bass and drums. I mean, I play bass and drums uh, sometimes quite well, mm. other times not. <laughs> but um, I, I used to watch, listen to their sound checks in the, in the, uh, the, um, the stadiums uh, that we were playing and, and the venues, which were actually pretty good venues sizes. And I was just amazed at the, the pocket that John, I didn't know him at the time, but that the bass player and the drummer had the late Frankie LaRocca. Mm. Um, he was with Atlantic records, but my God, he has such a great pocket, very Zeppelin, very baby sounding, actually, uh, English rock backbeat. And, but the tone that John was getting, it was, it was just biting and just, uh, it just very alluring to my ears. And so one time during the, the uh, sound checks, I just walked up to him afterwards and said, hey, uh, 
I, I got to introduce myself. I'm Todd Howarth. I play keyboards for, for Cheat Trick. Because he goes, yeah, 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 I know who you are. I, I see you up there singing, singing your butt off and singing a lot. And I said, thank you. I appreciate that. You know, so we talked, and he was very cordial, very approachable. And I told him, you know, that I, actually, I'm, I'm playing more guitar. I'm a lead singer, songwriter. And he said, really? So he took that into account of what could be possible the possibilities based mm-hmm. on the fact of the caliber musician, musician I was playing with uh, Cheap Trick. So I said, well, let me get your information. I'm working on a project that I really can't tell you what it is right now, but uh, yeah, it, this may be something that you know, may become uh, of some interest to you. Mm-hmm. So I said, great. You know, so we, we you know, uh, chatted up through the rest of the tour, and, and then I think probably about four months later, or so he'd called me. It may have even been sooner. He said, look, uh, we're ready to to add a player to this project uh, that I'm working on, and, and, and it's, it's called Fraley's Comet, and that's with Ace Fraley from Kiss. Mm. And, of course, I knew I knew who Kiss was, and I knew Ace Fraley was. I, you know, um, I, I was not uh, a person to, li- to listen to a lot of Kiss records, you know, I'll be honest with that. I've, I've said that over and over, but I knew that Ace Bailey was an incredibly talented and iconic guitar player. So that's how I met John Regan. Mm. Fantastic. Nice. Um, let's get on to, I guess, more recent news here. Uh, late 2022, you released a, a, a three-part series album on CDs called Comet Canvas, Heavy Canvas, and The Coastal Canvas. Can you give our listeners an, an insight um, on releasing such an ambitious, prog- uh, I guess, body of work, progressive body of work, yeah. at the same time? Oh yeah, that I, I got it. Well, thank you for asking about that. Uh, yeah, we're, we're really fast forward from from uh, that that era to to now. I, in, in 2014, I want to work on one more solo record where I was playing and doing everything. Mm. And, you know, it, it, yes, it's ambitious, but I've done it before. Uh, I, I'm just, it's, it's kind of a challenge, and it's also very easy scheduling because I know the drummer, I know the bass player, I know the singer, I know the guitar player, the keyboard player, <laughs> and I can also fire him, but I have to rehire him the next damn day. Yeah. That happened a lot. I just, but that's another funny story. Um, so what I did is I, I, I started writing songs for the heavy, the heavy, um, what would be uh, heavy canvas? I didn't have a title. I just was, you know, writing heavy songs, and that's about the time that John Regan had called me up and said, "Hey, let's do a 25-year reunion with uh, Fraser's Comet if I can get Ace to agree to it." So would you do it? I said, "Well, hell yeah, I'll do it. I mean, why not? Uh, you know, it'd be a lot of fun." Well, it never never came to pass. So in in after that, I continued to write songs. But during that plan, um, John had said, uh, "Look, uh, let's 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 put a project together, and and maybe I'm sorry, I'm cooking here at the same time. <laughs> no worries." <laughs> um, he he said, "Let's put a band together and do a certain amount of our songs and Kiss songs and or you know friendly comment songs, blah blah blah." And long story short, I said, "That you know, it's fine. I can I can do that, uh, but I'm working on my solo stuff." We ended up turning that band into Four by Fate, mm-hmm. and that had a lot of uh, good players that had come into it, and unfortunately, one that had passed, and now, of course, John passing, that makes two. Uh, so I used some of my rock songs that I was working on uh, for the for Relentless CD. Meanwhile, I kept on writing songs for the CDs, or the CD, uh, for this this canvas set, I had a fan tell me, you know, you should do some acoustical version of the Comet songs, mm. and I thought that's a great idea. Yeah. And then um, further stupidity on my part <laughs> was, oh, I'll record an easier listening CD at the same time. So here I am uh, polishing up what would be about thirty, twenty nine, thirty songs <laughs> for three CDs. I will never. <laughs> ever do that again because I, I you know the work is unbelievable yeah. and I mean it was a lot of fun I mean 10 11 good strong songs on a rock record that's that's one thing or, or any given genre but to do that many hats and that many songs um, 
Oh, it just drove me nuts. So that was about, it took uh, about five years to complete. Wow. Yeah, and the bass player is always late for practice. <laughs> yeah, you know, and the singer is an asshole, <laughs> which is always a problem. And well, he never helps unload the equipment. <laughs> Well, I wanted to ask more about that whole process because I am always fascinated by guys that can do that. That can that can play all the instruments. That I mean, I'm a huge Queen fan, and you know, Roger Taylor solo albums were Great that stuff. way. Can you talk more about, you know, the, the daunting task of that and 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 making it all work. That that's a great question, actually. Um, the the fact is, I can. You 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 come up with a song on the dominant or the uh, the. the uh, the, the tonic dominant instrument and the tonic melody of whatever you come up with. I wrote several different songs and off of several different instruments, and some were, were even the drums. Um, you establish the song, you hopefully get an arrangement out of it, and of course it changes and morphs through the process, um, usually involuntarily, which pisses me off because now I got to change everything I just fucking did. Um, <laughs> And it, you establish a time frame, you know, the time, the meter. And then, of course, you have to play it to a click track. Yeah. That is the most, that's the worst thing ever. Uh, it, it works for certain songs, but to try to get a live band feel, it's very difficult to do. So I, I'm, I'm well-versed at, 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 you know, kind of doing a, you know, speeding up the anticipation in the meter and then lagging on the meter as I hear it. Because I'm actually playing, you know, real drums. They're they're actually electronic drums, but that I did that for consistency reasons and expediency of uh, your recording process. Because I go and fix shit uh, the day after when I recorded a drum track and thought it was fantastic, and went back and listened to it and went, "God, you fucking suck, Marty <laughs> Rebel. You're just the worst." So. It it's a process. It, it's very lengthy, and then your ears dead, and, and and then I did all the mastering and mixing too, um, not in that order. But uh, it, it's it just it's very it is daunting. But the 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 end result for a lot of the tracks is just it's like oh my god, this is just phenomenal yeah. for what I've accomplished. It's a personal accomplishment. Right. The production is pretty damn good, but it is very difficult. And then you. You go back, you, you write the dominant, you record the drums, you go and re-record the, uh, the principal instruments, then you learn things you want to do different with the drums, so you do different drums, then your legs will give out because you're not 20 anymore, and you know, then you play bass, and your right hand goes, okay, fucker, we've had enough of you playing bass, especially when it was a 12-string bass that Tom Peterson gave me. Uh, and then I'm singing, and uh, yeah, it, it's, I, I, I tell you, I, I don't... <laughs> I don't wish that on anybody. Here, go do three albums. <laughs> well, that leads to, Never. Know, that leads me to the next question. And, and you said it took <laughs> about five years uh, to complete right. this task. But you know, this ideology of <laughs> releasing this abundance of material at one time was it always this you know, your strategic plan to do this, or did it just kind of fall this in, in you know all together this way? How did it work? Well, it, it did fall t together that way with suggestions. I mean, I thought, I'm going to get another rock album out. Um, and then the Comet thing, uh, acoustical idea came up. and said, well, you know what? This would be good because I can do the rock stuff and I can have a reprieve by doing, you know, uh, uh, just some simple, simple Comet uh, acoustical things. Everything's acoustically. Uh, well, that didn't work out because I would do something acoustically. Go, well, this, this could be a lot better. And I go into this big production, how to do it, and, and of course some of the songs turned out fucking phenomenal. I mean, um, uh, new kind of lover. Uh, somebody told me to why don't you do that on a piano. I said what? <laughs> uh, yeah, a fan told me that. I said wait, wait, what? Uh, new, and I thought about it. Wait a minute, you have something there, and so that turned out to be one of my favorite tracks on there. Nice. Um, and then the coastal uh, com, uh, coastal canvas is, of course, just easy listening stuff. You know, my my uh, piano and acoustic guitar ramblings of, and fretless bass. That's another thing. Pr playing fretless bass, what a bitch that is. You know, I've got perfect pitch and intonation, but playing a fretless bass is just an art form into it, unto itself. You know, so um, I thought I'm going to get this done. I, I'd never start a project and not complete it. I did Cobalt Parlor uh, with all real instruments by myself. 
And then my first solo effort was a um, called the Silhouette, where I had to program all the drums on one of my cheap trick keyboards because I didn't have a drum set. And I was t- such a broke ass at that time, I couldn't <laughs> afford one. So I programmed the songs, and that took me about 40 hours on every song. And it sounded okay, but, you know, it's a little, ugh. that's why I did uh, a Cobalt Parlor. And then I did Opposite Gods, another one, with when I'm playing everything. But I thought, I'll, I'll do one more. And now, uh, since I've got these three in the, you know, of course, they're, they're, they're being uh, sold at... Uh, ToddHoward.biz, which is my Shopify uh, store, I'm going to probably sell out of the pressing I did, which will be good. I don't think I'll do it again, but I've got one more rock idea in mind, but this can be all real band, and it's going to be all real energy, and it'll be like almost like virtually live recording because I just fucking hate the meter. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> well, as the... The, the the canvas albums were completed and you were done tinkering um as a satisfaction level were you satisfied with the end product with everything or did you have that moment you say i wish i would have done this differently or that differently how did it work oh yeah i'm an anal musician of course i always think well this is fucking horrible i could redo <laughs> it far better all over again and then I think, what are you, crazy? It's like going back in time and pretending that you're a stud, you know? It's just not going to happen. So I did realize that I'm going to uh, polish it up the best that I can. I did have the opportunity to uh, redo a lot of tracks because I lost a year of work yeah. on one of my machines because it dumped everything and I did not save it properly. Oh, no. Yeah, yeah I, I was horrif- horrified. I mean, it took everything I had not to grab, well, every <laughs> defensive device I have and uh, just tear up the whole studio. <clears throat> but um, I, 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 I did everything. Uh, I got it. I, I re- recut everything, and it turned out better than, than expected. Two songs, I had lost the master tracks. Fortunately, I had I'd finished them. And I did a test mix and mastering, and two of those songs are on two of the records, two of the CDs, as they were. I, I, I could, there's no way I could re-record them and capture <laughs> one. And, and they're both very sad songs. One is a song about my my dog uh, Alfie uh, on uh, the coastal canvas. Mm-hmm. It's called um, Your Little Heart, and there was no way I was going to recapture that, that emotion. Yeah. And one of the hardest songs I've ever had to sing. And then the other song that I lost uh, the master to was a song called uh, Never Said, which is about, and that's on the heavy rock. It's a ballad, but it's on the heavy rock CD, Heavy Canvas. And that's about my, my late best friend who, um, he was a, here in San Diego, he was a male model. But he was a gearhead and a desert, you know, uh, off-road guy, mm. and he looked like a cross between Rob Lowe and Brad Pitt. <laughs> that fucker got more paint than I would ever <laughs> think of getting. But he was such a cool guy because we got along so great. And he was a musician. Well, he played guitar, but he <laughs> one time he saw me playing guitar and singing at the same time. He didn't really know the depth of my my. Um, pedigree. He said, son of a bitch, you sing too? I said, who doesn't sing when they play guitar? You know? But he got in a, um, a Harley accident and he was paralyzed from the waist down and uh, he lived for 14 years before he committed suicide. Oh, sorry, and so yeah. this song is about him and we were very close. Uh, yeah, that was another uh, very difficult song to sing. Um, I'm just barely getting through this conversation right now because it was highly emotional. I mean, the guy was like, I only have like three or four best friends here uh, in in my in San Diego, and what, actually ones in Hawaii. Uh, but that that's about him. And and I lost the track, but I, I salvaged what I had and I made it work. So there's a lot of labor of love in all three of the, the uh, CDs, and I think that the Comet fans will really appreciate. Um, the acoustical versions as well because they matured. I mean, I did break out mm. on you know yeah. acoustic mm-hmm. stuff, and I'm playing the drums again. Not a drummer, 
And uh, but I, you know, got in there and did my best, Anton Fig, and it's, <laughs> it's special, but it's fun. <laughs> Fantastic, Jeff. Do you have the next one, or let me take the next? Well, one? yeah, because I I was listening to the I went back and reminiscing and listened to the Freely's Comet um, albums this morning while I was working out, and uh, and I hadn't really I was telling Eric I hadn't really kind of honed in on on your songs that you know as much as you know not not necessarily when you're younger not knowing that there was two guys singing there because I you know I didn't I didn't know that at the right. time, but um, boy I was like man there's some great stuff here and and so I started listening to it and I go man I want to hear what this sounds like I would love to hear one of these songs covered like in a a new modern version or you know and new technology and then i discovered today uh, four by fate and i'm like oh, that's what i was looking for i'm like this is awesome wow. so can, can you talk a little bit more about that four by fate project i know you briefly talked to, talked about it earlier yeah, but four by fate it it, it was and, and thank you for that i mean thank you for acknowledging that i get a lot of messages and emails and as a matter of fact i've done quite a few interviews in the last couple of weeks and that's why there was a little bit of confusion I, I mean, on my cell phone alone has 1,100 message, uh, emails. I, I can't yeah. follow the, the thread. But um, Four by Fate, <clears throat> we put it together, and the initial members were of uh, Stet Howland on drums yeah. from Wasp, Sean Kelly from uh, his own band, Crash Kelly in Canada, tremendous guitar player, and John and me. It was put together by uh, a guy named Mitch Lef not put together, but uh, it was somewhat organized by um, two people, actually, Mitch Lafon and Danny Stanton, who uh, Danny has helped uh, Ace do a lot of stuff, and he worked with Twisted Sister and a few other people, and he's become a very good friend as well. Well, we never played together, and we decided to do some shows and try to, to put it all, and I was very rusty. We got it back together, and we did a showcase back in Long Island, just kind of like a, this, let's see what we can make happen here. And uh, Stet Howland came in, and you know he's a tremendous drummer, great guy, great showman, and he sings. He sings um, pretty damn good for a drummer, uh, you know, in the rock and roll sense of, you know, mixing it up. He didn't have quite the backbeat feel that that we wanted uh, initially. John and I wanted, um, and John and I, you know, when we play, uh, when we hook up and play live. It's pretty intimidating because you know, I'm a rhythm guitar player, but I play, you know, my my Steinberger is through 100 watt Marshall, and it's a big fucking sound. <laughs> and John, of course, is a big fucking sound. And if you don't follow that big fucking sound, you get the evil eye from John. And so John made uh, Stet a little uneasy <laughs> at times. <laughs> and then we we had Sean Kelly, who was a great player, but he was completely caught off guard by the fact of how heavy we were. But we were never any heavier than we were in Fraley's Comet. Yeah. It just doesn't really sound heavy until you hear us play live. And then people go, holy fuck, there's some balls-to-the-wall sound here, you know? So, as everybody knows, well, maybe you don't know, Stet, before we got, just before we got into the studio, um, Stet Howland, I mean, days before we got in there, that Howland got in a car accident and couldn't do the tracks. So we were freaking, and he didn't tell us. I mean, for whatever reason, I'm not faulting him. But, you know, we're like, Jesus Christ, we've got to find a drummer. So Danny found us, A.J. Perrell from mm -hmm. Twisted Sister. Yeah. I didn't know anything about A.J. Perrell. I knew Twisted Sister because they played with us in Cheap Trick um, occasionally over the years. Um, you know, they had some great songs. They were very popular. They, they paid their dues. You know, I was fairly indifferent about them. But A.J. Perrell's drumming was, oh, my God, what a monster. So we got him in the project, and uh, at that time, uh, about that time, we got to record the first six songs. He learned what he could uh, over the CDs that I sent him. I mean, over, overnight, I guess I had to overnight him some CDs. And then we got in the studio, and I taught him the songs we, we cut in the studio. Sometimes just two piece, and then John would join in after listening, because you know he would analyze what what uh, AJ Perro was doing, mm -hmm. and he also realized that AJ Perro was a you know a jazz drummer, because a lot of jazz drummers that go rock or do rock have a great swing and backbeat feel, and that's paramount to anything uh, rock as far as I'm concerned. And John, um, at that same time uh, we had uh, Sean Kelly. He he put he emailed his parts in to assemble the, the tracks from uh, Canada. 
uh, and I had to kind of modify them to make them. They were great, but I had to modify them to make them fit into the tracks because they're a little bit ahead of the beat, if I remember correctly. I'm not faulting him. I'm just saying that's the style. And about the time that he heard them back, he says, you know, uh, I'm going to have to leave this project because two things, you guys are way heavier than I thought, like I, I said. <laughs> and uh, and I would have never played those leads that way. I said, I, yeah, I, I figured as much. But I had to cut them up because you're such a great player. I mean, he had some red beach from winger type stuff. It was a fucking phenomenal. But it was too fast, so I had to back it up. And I laid it in the track a certain way, and it just sits in it so beautifully, in my opinion now. So that's 4x8 at that point. And then uh, we take a break. Um, we're going to record after Christmas at that time. And um, A.J. Perrell, and I saw him at uh, Danny Stanton's wedding in New York, and he didn't look good. He was playing with adrenaline mob at that point, and he, yeah. he, but he looked very unhealthy. I say, you feel okay, dude? Yeah, I'll be good. We'll, we'll get back in track and finish up the rest of the songs. You know, come uh, in the first part of the next year. I said, okay, great. Well, he didn't make it, of course. He mm -hmm. passed away from a heart attack. So that's we got Rob Afuso in there uh, because Pat Gasparini, the new guitar player that we pulled in and songwriter that, that put in some songs, uh, phenomenal music. Matter of fact, I spoke to him today. That's something else I got to tell you about. I spoke to him today about a, a tribute thing we're going to be doing for John uh, out in in uh, in uh, Webster Falls, Poughkeepsie, in probably July, August, uh, sometime. But uh, so Pat came into the band, and and we had a couple of people that, that spoke to Rob Afuso, and so we got Rob interested in doing the project as long as he could do his corporate thing, which is making him very good money. Um, and his corporate band, and uh, so we play with him. We got we knocked the rust off his ass too. Uh, John and I did the very same thing. We play with him and looked at each other. And went okay. We need to break out the whips, you know. And and we did. And and, and Rob he popped up like okay, fuckers, I'm with you. And he brought it back and he was slamming. And and we recorded the next uh, I think it was six five six songs with uh, Pat Gasparini, um, and he and Pat wrote some great songs, and, and Rob got in there and kicked ass, and on one of the tracks, it's hilarious, there was, at the, I don't know why, but in, in the drum in the drum room, or the, the uh, recording booth of the drums, where he's banging them with the drums, and he gets done, and he picks up a, a box of piccolos and flutes and starts making all this fucking sounds that like Jethro Toll on helium. <laughs> and we're laughing like crazy, like, what the fuck are you doing? And so we just took, we, we left it in there. It, you can hear it in the track. I forget what song it is. But uh, awesome. it, it was a lot of fun. Yeah. I mean, it, and we got it out. We got it pressed. And and the uh, the band name, or the, the title of the CD is a result of my, one of my, we were trying to come up with an idea for the song. What, what, what could... I mean, it's a name for the, the, the CD. And my son at that time had, uh, he was going back to, to college, and he was living in my big recording studio here in San Diego, and he wanted to get a dog. And he got this pug, and I said, look, before you get the dog, don't you know, just think about this before you do this. No, I want to get a dog. Okay. So I got the dog. Two weeks later, he looked at me going, oh, my God. I really should have thought this through. <laughs> this fucking dog is just relentless. <laughs> so I remember him saying that, and I went relentless. Yeah, I came up with a name for the for the CD. Oh, so cool! Very cool. Uh, you know, besides the uh, Canvas series albums that you just released, uh, a lot of our listeners might not realize that you've had five solo albums. Um, with so much solo material that you've released since what 1995, you know, is your blueprint? Are, do you feel as though that you're more of the solo artist, or do you still feel like you're that guy that belongs in a band? Where are you at? Uh, you know, thank you. That's a very good question. Um, no, I belong in a band. I mean, I will. I, I can. I, I can do both because it's it's never been about me. I've always been about um, you know being in a band and, and adding the the. Uh, the sum is greater than you know the solo of each idiot that's in the band, <laughs> um, and it, it's it's just like I play with a, a, a band here. We just did a, a, a local gig, which was a lot of fun, 
from my top 40 band back in the 70s. We're all still alive. <laughs> That's how old we are. <laughs> um, but these guys are phenomenal musicians, um, including my, my cousin by marriage, Jason Sheff, who was a, a bass player, lead singer for the band of Chicago for many years. Mm. Um, he didn't make this particular gig we did, so we had to hire somebody else. But no, I, I can, I, I, it, band is fun because it's, um, you have other equa- you have other people in the band that add so much to it. Sure. Uh, and, and it really is important to play off each other. Uh, solo artists, yes, I can do that too. And I just very well may end up doing that. Um, matter of fact, I, I'm tomorrow night, I'm going up to see Robin Zander, uh, from Cheap Trick, his son play in LA. Nice. And I, I, I called him up and said, Hey, I'm going to see your son. It's all oh, cool. You know, I might be there too. I said, Great, I'll see you there. And I'd mentioned Robin Zander years ago. I said, You know, when you decide to retire, we should, you know, do a acoustic tour together and, and have a lot of fun with that. And he thought, Hmm, that's you know, not a bad idea, but who knows that that'll ever come to, to pass. But I can do both. Um, but I'm not an egomaniac where I have to do a solo thing. It's like playing lead guitar. I can play lead. I can, I can do, but everything is a melody to me, but I don't have to be the center of attention because I just don't care. I I just want what's when I see the, the people in the audience, you know, they're happy to listen to songs they want to hear, be it mine or not mine. It's a great thrill. Uh, I will say that in London, when we played Something Moved, we filmed uh, Hammersmith Odeon uh, live concert. That was amazing. The people were just, they went out of their minds for it, and they knew the words, they were singing it, and I've never had uh, that type of chill again, I nice. think, um, since uh, you know playing uh, Maybe It's Over Now for the first time. Yeah, yeah, very good. I wanted to go back to 19... Ni- excuse me. Edit that. Yeah. Um, I want to go back to 1997. Uh, you released the uh, Cobalt Parlor. Um, California Burns is my favorite track on that album. But can you talk in a little bit more and give our listeners an insight about the creation of that album? That uh, Cobalt Parlor was it was a very dark period for me. I had I had had a I met a a, a beautiful woman in. Wisconsin, and I ended up moving her back to California with me. And she looked like the the, uh, the actress Madeline Stowe. She was Greek, and she was just stunning. And I was I was very enthralled with her. And, and I hoped to, that we could uh, you know have a relationship that would go into you know uh, some type of duration for for a rocker. Um, but th- when I was recording, starting to record uh, Cobalt Parlor, it was deep and dark and heavy. And I wanted to do something where I wasn't constantly in the, in the trees singing, you know, bringing down a few octaves, you know, three, I guess, to be exact. And at that time, it was about when I was just getting ready to write and record and sing it, all the finals of what I was um, putting together, she decided that she wanted to either I gave her, you know, we got married and I, we had kids or she was, she was going to leave. And I said, uh, well, I already have three kids that I can barely afford now. There's no way fucking hell that I'm going to have any more kids you know, on purpose. I said, uh, so you make your decision. So she, at that time, her parents lived in Pahrump, Nevada. And she packed up her stuff and, and uh, she moved in with the parents. Matter of fact, the song, The Way to Pahrump, is about the event of her leaving on a roadmap mm-hmm. to her, her, her folks at home. Um, so a lot of the songs were about centered around her, uh, and a few of the songs centered around another woman that I almost married back in the early nineties. Um, when I was playing with cheap trick and I met this woman who was huh, actually the, the girlfriend of our lighting director, which did not go over well cause she dumped him to go after me. So consequently I was in the fucking darkness for many months. <laughs> on stage uh, because he just tuned me right the fuck out. But um, Cobalt Parlor has a, a very, a very special place in my heart as far as deep, dark emotions. Um, and I remember recording that uh, I would get up early in the morning to do the drums, like at 5 o'clock in the morning because I was doing a lot of physical labor then. 
on on my family's commercial business real estate, and there's no way I could drum later on in the afternoon after doing physical work. Being at that you know that time, I was you know still what forty forty something years old. Mm-hmm. Very good. I guess I wanted to kind of bring this to uh, 1981. Uh, you joined 707, uh, recorded the band's Bridge album. That album wasn't released for, what, 18 years after you guys recorded that album? Can you give our listeners a little insight on what went wrong with that album and how did it all work out? Well, that, yeah, after after we did, uh, after I did the tour, we did the tour um uh, I joined 707, and we ended up doing the High Infidelity tour with Ario Speedwagon. That's the biggest tour that I've done to date, period. Mm. Um, I mean, venue-wise, it was just amazing. I thought, we're it. We're done. We're, we made it. We're, we're on our way. Mm-hmm. Um, we, they had already had two albums out, uh, the first album and then the very uh, cleverly uh, titled second album. <laughs> um, and then, yeah, I wasn't involved. And so when it came time to record, record a third album, we, uh, were going for, uh, somewhere on some rock stuff, eclectic rock stuff, not as heavy as I wanted to go by any stretch, but we were on our way recording it and, uh, we were under, uh, uh, it was going to be with Casablanca records. Neil Bogart, I believe, uh, was involved. He was a big 707 uh, supporter and fan, and he was instrumental in keep getting this going. So we recorded the album, got it done, and uh, setting up for, for rele- to release, and Neil died. And so the, la- the label, you know, the business of suits, they had no idea what to do with this. And then the whole thing about heavy rock was coming back in, which thrilled me because I wanted to be heavy, heavy. Yeah. Um, but they had no idea what to do with it, so they just shelved the record. And it, it I didn't, you know, I didn't own the rights to it. I was principally a hired gun. I wasn't even signed to the record deal, to be honest with you. I, I I've never been signed to any record deal. Uh, besides my own with shot records, which is Cobalt Parlor, mm-hmm. not even with Ace Fraley. That was all Ace Fraley stuff. Mm-hmm. So it, it, the album was shelved, and we ended up recording, uh, that, and that was titled The Bridge, and then we, and that was with John Stronach, the producer, who also uh, was doing stuff with Fleetwood Mac, Joe Walsh, um, and his assistant, uh, engineer was Michael Clink, who did Appetite for Destruction yes. for uh, Guns N' Roses. And that's another story I got, which is actually my autobiography that I'm definitely trying to finish up here this year. Um, so that was shelved. We ended up recording another record on Boardwalk, uh, Boardwalk, Boardwalk Records uh, called Megaforce. Mm-hmm. And that's... Uh, when we did the the song, the title track for the movie, which was, uh, some people love the movie. It's probably one of the, one of the worst movies I've ever seen in my life. (laughs) Um, for the title track, the song mega force. Very good. And after, after that came out, uh, the band, uh, we had a lot of problems. Uh, we lost our management. We lost some band members. Um, I got, I could go into hours on that, but, uh, (laughs) that was the beginning of the end. Well, Good. save it for the book. We'll read about it. <laughs> Definitely. Um, <laughs> you know, it's just something I probably have never really done much with with the artists we interview. But uh, hobbies outside of music. What? Uh, what? Mm. You got any hobbies that you, you tinker around with cars or anything? Yes, and thank you for asking because that's my favorite fucking thing. Um, <laughs> growing up, I was my uh, here in Point Loma. I'm real near the beach. In fact, I'm very close to where I grew up. Uh, my my dad got married to my stepmom back in '66. They met in late '64, and her father had a horse ranch up in the uh, in the mountains. And of course, I'm allergic to everything besides women, music, and and uh, and the engines. So here's the horse ranch. You're like, why couldn't he be a fucking Ferrari owner? You know. 
Uh, but never, I, we're, we're here on the, uh, the horse ranch. And so I gravitated towards anything with an engine. Because my dad, he's a gearhead, and, yeah. and he's still alive, 86 years old. Just had a meeting with him today on some business properties. And uh, I would, I had a go-kart. I wore that fucker out. Yeah. And I had a mini bike. I destroyed that thing. And I had other motorcycles. My dad bought, bought a motorcycle. I rode that thing and commandeered it from him. Um, and so I, I got into motocross when I was really young and, 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 and off-road stuff. I'm also a, a painter. I paint and illustrate. I do a lot of uh, acrylic paints and oils that are uh, of things that interest me, which is chrome reflection and automobiles and, and that type of thing. I was in an advanced art class when I was very young and through high school. Um, I've always ice skated, roller skated. Later on in life, because I was touring so much, I, I finally learned how to snow ski, which took me like a day, uh, at 30 years old, 31 years old. And then I got into snowboarding. And then the wife and I got a boat. Uh, and uh, the current wife, uh, 24 years, we got a, actually we're on our second boat now. Uh, I wakeboard, I, I ski. Um, back in off road, I, I bought a sand rail that, oh, yeah. that I used in one of my uh, solo. CD, um, a solo, uh, recordings, um, called cold beach. I used my, my sand rail that I just sold a while back in that video. Uh, it's Corvette engine, 2,200 pounds, 500 horsepower. And I just had a blast with that blast with that out at the glamorous sand dunes here. So I still do that. I still do the off-road stuff. I have quad runners out there and, and, and occasionally a motorcycle if I can steal it from somebody because <laughs> I just yeah I, I can't have all the fucking toys I know but um, so that's that and the we the wife and I have a forty foot diesel pusher motor home which is fun to play with uh, I've had that we've had that now for twenty twenty one years wow we nice. do Sturgis Lake Havasu uh, we've got a mammoth in it uh, uh, a lot of trips I took I, I use it move my son back to Texas. Um, that, those are my hobbies. And of course my, I, I'm an avid shooter. I've been shooting since I was seven years old and I have three uh, CCWs, including one here in California, three different States. Uh, so I shoot, um, for, um, for, for sport as well, you know, personal level, nothing, yeah. uh, I don't compete, but I'm very active. I don't sit still. Um, I pretty much my, my, my mother's, my real mother's kid. I, I just, matter of fact, just before I sat down to call you guys, I was working on our, our new boat, which is, uh, it's slightly used. So I had to do some cleanup on it and we're taking it out this weekend, uh, to do a, a run through to make sure there's nothing that needs to be fixed on it. So of course for me, it has to be perfect. Like a show car. Yeah. I do a lot of, uh, auto restor restoration rebuilds. I had a big block Corvette 427, 1969 for 26 years. Um, and my father has 25 cars, which are, I actually, I think he's got more than that. He's hiding a couple on me. I don't have to find them. <laughs> yeah. Um, but they're, they're all in my name. And we just showed one of the recent completions, um, a 1957 T-Bird, which is the year oh, I was born. Nice. Yeah. We just showed it at the La Jolla Concours de Elegance, where there are probably a trillion dollars worth of cars, Duesenbergs, Ferraris, Lamborghinis. Some fucking cars I don't even know. Have, they have one initial, you know, <laughs> one letter as a name. I, it was a phenomenal uh, show. And then, of course, uh, La Jolla looks like a Dr. Seuss land because that's where Dr. Seuss uh, wrote all his books from, La Jolla. <laughs> yeah. So when in the world do you have time to create music? <laughs> huh. um, you know, that, that is a good question. <laughs> I, it, I'm like uh, Eddie Van Halen in the bathroom of uh, Two and a Half Men when he comes out and and when he did a guest shot there, and Charlie Sheen goes, even in the bathroom? <laughs> and he goes, hey, wherever inspiration strikes you. Yeah. I have the guitars, of course, everywhere. Um, I've got new songs. I'm talking to guys that are here locally that are players. Uh, there's this one monstrous drum uh, drummer down here. His, his name's George. He plays for Bruce, uh, not Bruce, uh, Rick Springfield. Oh, yeah. But he lives here in San Diego, and the guy is a motherfucker pounder. And then I've got two other drummers that, that I would like to work with as well, and uh, a few uh, bass players and guitar players. Um, 
but I always write songs. I'm always constantly writing. I, I just wrote another one. Uh, was it yesterday? I had my my little acoustic in in the back of the property, lean up against the '60 Cadillac in El Dorado, and I picked it up. I come up with this idea. So it, it they the songs come, and I can't stop them. Unfortunately, fortunately, and unfortunately, I mean, I, one song on. Um, the easy listening uh, canvas, coastal canvas, yeah. is called uh, "There Are Angels," and it sounds somewhat religious. It's not. It can be construed as religious or faith, uh, you know, faith based, but it's really not. But I wrote that song. I swear to God, where I'm sitting right now in my in my house, in 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 bed, I was asleep and I wrote it, <laughs> and and I'm not. I woke up and I, the the melody and everything was going through my head. And I'm I'm staggering out of the bed. I'm slamming into walls and tripping over shit that my wife has put in the hallway. I'm going to blame her. Um, and my wife wakes up. What the fuck are you doing? I, I got to record a song. If I don't get to it, I'll forget it in the morning because that's what happens. And I got into the living room and I, I put on the the recorder and and mumbled out you know the the chord pattern and the melody. And that was called There Are Angels. If you get a chance. Uh, yeah, listen to that. Matter of fact, you know, you guys send me your addresses. I'll, I'll get you the, the set to see these out. Oh, oh thank yeah, you so thank much. You. Yeah, thank you. Um, you, ta- you. You had talked about the writing of your autobiography. And, um, you know, it, it just fascinates me when ar- artists such as yourself of, 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 of music, of, of acting, or, you know, athletes, whatever, um, <laughs> you take on a massive project like this of, of, of your of your life's experiences, how do you narrow down what to put in and then what not to put in? Because I would find everything to be important. <laughs> Fair enough. You know, yes, exactly. Uh, it, it's, and everything to the listener or the fan is important. And now, I, it, because there's, there's some trivial stuff that I think, ah, nobody's going <laughs> to care about this. But then again, you know, there's some stuff that Ace Fraley gave me and I pitched that I didn't think anybody would care about. And I'm thinking now, 35 years later, oh, what a dumbass you were. <laughs> you know, I should have held on to that stuff. But, yeah, I wasn't that type of guy. Um, yeah. But the I have – my retention it, it generally is horrible. I, I'm, I'm kind of like my father. My father's very good with math and, and, and knows finances and does very well and very methodical uh, as far as a, a blue-collar worker. Never went to college, but he's now a multimillionaire, uh, you know, investing in the proper uh, commercial real estate and business. Um, but if, if a pair of boobs goes by him, forget it. It's all over with, you know. His <laughs> retention isn't worth a shit. And, and I'm kind of the same way because when I was younger, I, I didn't play music because I wanted to be a rock star. The, the fringe benefits were fantastic, <laughs> you know, because like, I love women a lot. And so I thought, this is a tremendous way to get some. Hopefully... They're women, and generally, usually, they are. They were for me, anyhow. Yeah. But the joke being uh, that the, the autobiography is it's my retention comes flooding back to me when I start remembering all the points in time, and there's so much to all the points in time of, of of my influences and things that have happened, and I believe they'll be of importance to certain people. And and I I will I haven't needled some stuff out or edited some stuff out. I've also spoken to some women about you know some of the sex stuff in there because yeah I'm not going to brag but you know I wasn't playgirl um, and uh, some of the stories I have are are just phenomenal. So the women have said you got to put that stuff in there, but I'm thinking well I I, I can't put it in the cadence of regular writing. Right. Mm-hmm. Because that's going to turn some people off. They're not going to want to hear about that bullshit. But I could add separate chapters at the end of the book for those who wish to read. Mm. So I'm going to probably put in about maybe half a dozen episodes of things that happened with, for me, or to me, whatever, <laughs> that were just amazing. <laughs> I mean, amazing. And, you know, I, and I may take a little bit of creative uh, yeah. liberties, but not really, because, you know, three women in one club, oh, my God, and two, you know, blah, blah, blah. There's a lot to write. But um, the, my biggest fear is not remembering everything that's important. Mm. And 
uh, you know, the wife and I have gone to Sturgis now three times, you know, to, with the motorhome and the bikes, the Harleys, and had a blast there. But when I was playing with Cheap Trick, we did it a couple times, and I always thought, oh, man, I'd, one day I'd like to come back here if I ever get a street bike. And I remembered just recently when I was writing the book and editing it that we were there walking uh, with Cheap Trick. We were walking to the stage, and Mackenzie Phillips was walking with us, uh, you know, from – from uh, oh god, what the hell was that? Uh, the show with uh, with uh, uh, Eddie Van Halen's wife, uh, Valerie Bertinelli. Um, uh, she, was, she was a big music fan, cheap freak fan. So she's walking with us. Peter Fonda was there. He jumped up on stage and played Surrender. And then backstage, when we're, when we're all hanging out, uh, Larry Hagman was there. <laughs> cool nice. and. But he was, I mean, of course, his eyes were just bloodshot as all get out, uh, which unfortunately eventually took him out. But, uh, I mean, it's stuff like this that will make the reading of the book, I think, fun for a lot of people. Oh, sounds yeah, cool. sounds like a bestseller to I'm me. I'm going to order that one. Absolutely. <laughs> yeah, it, it's going to be fun. And I'm also going to do an audio. When, once I have it uh, um, edited professionally, because uh, I can't do everything and I refuse to at this point. Um, I will I will uh, do an audio book for it because a lot of people want to be able to hear it. Well, I've got a lot of trucker fans that, and traveling fans that want to be able to slip it in a podcast or, what, or sure. however these you know people are doing nowadays. The young people, <laughs> exactly. Um, you know, you've worked with some of the biggest names in rock and roll: Ace Frehley, Ted Nugent, Cheap Trick, and yeah. so on. Um, you know, how have those experiences molded you as a musician? Has it changed you much? Uh. Yes, it has, and each one of them has a just different aspect of the indelible imprints that were made. I think uh, the most important one is that you've never made it. There will always be a struggle. You will continue to work hard, and you better want it badly. Yeah. Uh, with with 707, like I said, I thought, I made it. We're touring with Audio Speedwagon. Even though I was warned to stay away from the keyboard player's girlfriend, you know, <laughs> that's a, a true story. Um, it, it, the things you learn after the fact is like, my God, I, okay, this is this is what I've done. This is what I played with all the big bands. What are they doing to continue uh, the viability of their brand, their their industry, and then the changing times, and then all of a sudden after I'm done with uh, Seven Hundred Seven. I'm pumping gas. You know, I, I'm, I'm, I'm working for my uncle in, in a place called El Cajon here in San Diego, pumping yeah. gas, because I've got no other, uh, you know, I, I need, I, I, at this point, I had two, uh, two kids that, that, that I need to attend to. Mm-hmm. And uh, then you, you start playing with Nugent. Oh, okay, everything's going to be good again. Um, and then, um, then I'm back to pumping gas, you know, and working, doing side stuff as, as a model mechanic. I, you know, I do that as, as a hobby. And um, I learned that the names were not important to me. The the respect behind the brand and the people, yeah. they were. But I was never impressed by anybody that I met. I was happy to meet them, but I really didn't think that they were, you know, they're just people. They were talented people, lucky people, uh, in the right place people, or very smart people. Uh, it It taught me that, there will always be a struggle, and you better want it badly. So I uh, I learned that after Nugent, after uh, Cheap Trick, that was that was a because I, I played with them the longest, and that was a discipline in the totem pole. You know, the totem pole with you know the brightest figures on top, and then you get down towards the bottom, and yeah, well, you're not even fucking there. You're under the ground. You're the foundation of the fucking thing. You know, so it uh, was very. Um, illuminating for yeah. my place in the the music industry, so I never got too full of myself ever. And luckily, because it would have destroyed me, I had a you know uh, ended up playing a, as a hired gun for Cheap Trick twice. You know, first time, uh, which is fine, it was great. And then after Freddie's comment, I went back to them, and and I was back to being the hired gun. And talk about being humbled is like, okay, this is what happens, fucker. You've got uh, <laughs> responsibilities and kids. You just enjoy that 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 uh, ground view on the totem pole, mm. and uh, you, you're humbled, and um, you learn that 
in in an instant it could all be gone. Oh, true. Just saw those guys play Friday night, this past Friday night. Chief. Oh, really? Yeah, yeah. just went to their show fr- this past Friday night. Great show. Oh, cool. Yeah, yeah. Dax is doing a tremendous job. I think, was uh, Robin Jr. playing with him? He was not. He was Okay, yeah, because he's going to be in L.A. tomorrow night. I, uh, I'm going, I think I told you that. I'm going up there with my wife, and uh, and uh, we're going to see him. I think, I think his dad's going to be there. He said he might be there, so I may see him up there. But, you know, great band, one of the greatest bands. And I remember yeah. in my cover bands back in the late 70s, I wanted to play Cheap Trick, and they were like, oh, I'm playing this baby crap rock band, <laughs> pop shit. I said, are you kidding? These guys are fucking great. Yeah. Besides being, you know, image genius. Yeah. But, you know, never in my imagination that I realized I ended up playing with them back in 1985. Oh, so cool. Yeah. All right, so we're uh, running out of our allotted time for the evening. I got one more question for you, then we'll leave you alone. Sure. Yeah, um... I asked this question to all of our guests, the mystery of rock and roll, the dawning of the internet, social, all the different social medias has taken the mystery out of rock and roll. Um, but if we didn't have the internet, we wouldn't be doing this with you tonight. Um, but right. for you, the musician and the fan, you know, what do you prefer? Do you miss the mystery and the mystique of rock and roll? Or do you like this new age of accessibility? Well, it's a double-edged sword, of course. I think anybody with with uh, some insight would see that. the The days of when you know you picked a band, what, Skinner, Zeppelin. Which one are you in? You know, fuck you. I like Skinner. You know, that type of thing. You had a small, you know, several or far less choices. Uh, there was it, it's it's like meeting a new woman that you really don't know everything about. And, 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 and the, the, the mystery in the dark places, I wrote a song about that. The dark places that you visit, they can be very fun. They can also be very deadly. Yes. But the thing is that it, it, I miss that, um, that type of thing that I, I, I used to relish. Like I was a big, you know, I like sticks. Of course, I don't like songs that Tommy Shaw and, and, and James DeYoung wrote. <laughs> Um, and I, I like you know some of the Kansas stuff, uh, Aerosmith, uh, Humble Pie. I mean, I, I liked a lot of stuff, but I didn't really know that much about them. So when you did see or hear about them, it was always such such a, a, a cloak of mystery behind them, and that was fantastic. Well, they could afford that because there wasn't somebody younger banging on their door going, "Hey, we're better than you. We're going to kick your ass in the next couple of years." Now with everything that's out there, and all the bands. And and you can't have a lot of mystery. Some people do, I think, but some people will garner more uh, viewership and friends by uh, and fans by by being more open or accessible on the, as far as the internet goes. I mean, Taylor Swift is is one example of of you know, how brilliant that that marketing ploy was. Yes. And I got to tell you, I, when I first bought, we first bought our Sea Ray boat nineteen or no two thousand four. It was a magazine we got from the manufacturer, and it was about Sea Ray boats. And it was there was an article in there about her family that had bought a boat. And here's this young girl singing at the, one of the uh, the boat uh, celebration things. And she would, of course, later become huge. But she has made herself very accessible, as a lot of people have. And I guess it it, it depends on your perspective. Uh, the, from the business st- standpoint, to make yourself more accessible and more in the light is a good thing. Uh, but then you're also subject to shit that comes popping up, and, and unless you keep your nose clean, you know it's going to get put out there like, hey, you know, we saw you doing this with that and those people and this, and, and my God, I didn't know you were hermaphrodite. Yeah, whatever. Uh, <laughs> it's just shit that becomes too visible, you know. Exactly. Um, so yeah, I, I miss that. I miss the darkness, but I also embrace the business savvy of being accessible. Yeah, well said. Well, as we are running out of our allotted time, is there anything that we left off tonight that you would like to plug or promote? Well, I want to tell you guys, you did a tremendous job. Thank, thank you. you very much. Yeah, thank you. And thank you for being patient on the emails. Um, it, 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 it was a pleasure doing this, and, and I really appreciate that. Again. Uh, all my products right now will be are available, uh, and then some on uh, toddhoworth.biz. And the book I hope to have that done in the next couple months. Um, 
I will be doing a tribute thing with Four by Fate, a new Four by Fate in New York and the East Coast with Pat Gasparini, Rob Afuso, some other members, probably sometime in uh, July, August, nice. uh, somewhere in that area. Uh, and, and maybe some new acoustical sets as well. I'm not entirely sure. Um, and just to keep uh, an, an ear and eye out for uh, me on Facebook. Uh, my Facebook page, there's a couple of them, but the, the primary one is about me and everything that I do uh, and everything that I stand for, all that kind of stuff. So uh, just sidestep whatever you don't like and enjoy the stuff you do. <laughs> and I will be doing some live stuff. I'm going to be doing a lot of of live broadcast here as soon as I'm off restriction in the next 17 days. Oh, very good. Well, this is how things are going to work out. We're about, oh, two and a half weeks to three weeks behind on our scheduling for the speedy release. But Jeff, the editing wizard over here, will get this all cleaned up. And uh, I'll send it to you immediately, and please share it wherever you can. Oh, yeah, I definitely will. Fantastic. Thank you so much, Todd. Yeah, was, thank you. It was a pleasure and an honor. Very welcome, and thank you guys again for indulging in the in the uh, the missed emails. I, I swear to God, I shit gets buried here quicker than uh, you know Clinton graveyard. So, <laughs> understandable, man. I, <laughs> I appreciate it, brothers. All right, All take right. care of yourself. Good night. Thanks, Jeff. Yep. Thanks, Eric. Good night. See you. Just can't do it